Morning, church. Uh, it's so good to be preaching after a Bach win. I think uh, today would have been a lot harder if we were in a bad mood. Uh, last week, we played uh, Wales at 11, so the 10 was 10 a.m. was a lot uh, smaller, but I'm great, um, great that, we, that we don't have any more games and I'm, I can use the full two hours to preach. Um, but as I said, my name is Dave and it's such a privilege to be here. Um, I love this church and every time I get to preach, I just feel so encouraged by what, by what I'm seeing God do here. Uh, among you, you are beautiful people. Uh, and I've enjoyed being here the last two weeks. If, if you didn't get a chance to um, listen to the sermon, I encourage you to go online and have a listen to part one. That was last week's um, message. And uh, we're looking at a t- this two-week uh, series. I've called it Sync. And we're looking at uh, prayer, how prayer helps us sync with God. Because really this is such a privilege for us as believers that we get to embrace God through prayer. It's a unique Christian privilege. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said that of all the blessings of Christian salvation, none is greater than this. That we have access to God in prayer. This is such an amazing privilege for us that through the gospel we have been joined to Christ and now we get to embrace our Father in prayer. It's just so special to us. There are just some things we only learn and experience through prayer as we communicate and commune with our Father. And yet often we neglect this gift and we're too busy doing other things. And that Jesus has just been encouraging us last week in this to press into him because there is such blessing in prayer. God loves to meet us and he does things when we petition him and worship him and praise him. So um, could you grab a Bible and turn to chapter Matthew 6? Matthew chapter 6, if you're using the Bibles in front of you, uh, it's on page 5. That's the second page 5, the one towards the end of the book. And uh, last week we looked at how Jesus was encouraging us towards praying authentic prayers. That he was saying, don't pray uh, prayers that are just going through the motions or praying for show, but pray authentic prayers as you engage with me. And this week he tells us this is how we should pray. He's giving us what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, We're being very ambitious in going through the whole prayer in one morning. So it's going to be quick, but I pray that uh, we would be encouraged by God's grace to lean into him uh, and just encouraged to hear what he has to say to our hearts. So Matthew chapter 6, I'm dealing with verses 9 to 15 today, but I'm going to start reading from verse 5. Jesus says this, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Amen. So last week we looked at what Jesus said about authentic prayer and encouraging us to lean into praying genuine prayers as we engage with our Father one-on-one. And this week, um, Jesus is laying down some foundations for us in what we know as the Lord's Prayer. It might properly be called the Disciples' Prayer because it's for us. But uh, Jesus is laying down some of the most important things that we need to be considering when we pray. Uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but Jesus could have said many things 
uh, when he taught us how to pray. But he just includes these things. And, and I think the reason for that is simply that these are some of the high points that he wants us to keep in mind when we pray. These are some of the things he wants us to be thinking about and considering as we lean into him and ask for help and worship him. Now, it's a great thing to pray the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you grew up praying the Lord's Prayer at school or at home or whatever it is. Um, But Jesus isn't giving us a legalistic formula. This isn't just meant to be something we mindlessly repeat and regurgitate. This is more like a... um, categories of thought that Jesus is giving us to think through. Uh, It's more like a self-diagnostic tool that as we pray this Lord's Prayer, as we pray this Disciples Prayer, we would be thinking through each thing that he mentions, assessing our need in those areas and responding by crying out to him for help in each one of those things. This isn't meant to be something we mindlessly regurgitate. Jesus is giving us some things to assess our own lives and engage with him around. This is like a diagnostic tool. Jesus didn't say this is what you should pray. He says this is how you should pray. He's talking, that, he's talking about our spiritual health. He's saying if we want healthy lives, it begins in prayer and it's going to continue by praying and thinking about these things as we engage with him. So Jesus is giving us uh, six foundations of an authentic prayer life. That's what we're going to be looking at today. We're just going to be walking through the text and unpacking these six things. And the first thing Jesus says we need to consider as we pray, the first foundation is that we need to remember our position in God's family. He says, when you pray, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Anyone can say the words, our Father. But what Jesus is saying is that if you're Christian, you have entered into a son, daughter, father relationship with God. That he has become our father and you are his kids. If you're Christian, you receive a brand new spiritual status. You get positioned into his family and that becomes the reason why and how we can embrace our father. A.W. Tozer says something amazing for us to consider this morning. He says this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So what do you think about when you think about God? I think what Jesus is saying here is that if you remove the idea of God as a father, what you get is a cold and harsh God that we have to please and earn. That we have to work our way to earn his love and to earn his grace. And Jesus is saying he doesn't want us to live like scared hostages. He wants us to live like redeemed children because that's what we are. Children that get to run to our Father in prayer and know him and know the joy that he has for us. This is uniquely true in the gospel This is only a Christian thing that God is known as a father. I think Jesus is saying that we have two options. We can approach God based on religion or we can approach God based on the gospel. Now, I know Christianity is a religion, but there is a difference in the way religion works and the way the gospel works. The religion religion is about being good enough that one day we get to heaven, we'll, we'll be good enough to stay there. And that when we get there, God will way up our good works and our bad works and if we make the cut then he'll walk us in and then we'll know him as a father that we can work hard to earn grace and to earn love but in the gospel it's completely different the gospel tells us that because of what Jesus did we can have that before we've even lived well or badly and that we can have an eternity with him simply based on what he's done for us in his death and resurrection that he earns God's grace for us, that we can have God's love just based on his performance on the cross, that we can know God as Father and because he's made us his children. He's saying that we get to call God Dad. This is an amazing picture of adoption for us. Is that we were lost and dead. We were outcasts. We were slaves to sin. And he came and adopted us as his children. 1 
John 3, 1 says this, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. That is what we are. Jesus is saying our entire lives and our prayer lives depend on how we view God. Either we're going to view him in a way that we have to uh, appease him and earn his grace, or we're going to view him how the gospel tells us to view him. That because of what Jesus has done, he is our father and we are the king's kids. This is gospel 101. So Jesus starts out saying that when you pray, pray our father. He's saying, remember the gospel. Remember our position as his children, that we get to approach him as a father. The next thing Jesus says, the second foundation when we pray, is that we need to increase our praise of God's name. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed, it's, it's an old word talking about our reverence for God and, and our adoration and praise of him, our worship for him. But Jesus is saying that this adoration and this worship is so central to our faith but it's also so central to our whole lives because whatever we adore, we prioritize. Right? No one has to convince you and force you to do the things you love doing. You're gonna just do them because you love them. You're gonna go speak to that person because you love that person. You're gonna spend time doing or with the people or the things you love. Whatever we adore, we prioritize. Now, Jesus has given us lots of blessings in our life to enjoy and steward, but none more important than himself. And what he's saying is, when we come to him in prayer, when we hallow his name, we are reordering the priorities of our hearts and putting him back on his throne, as it were. Now, we struggle with this, don't we? Because we have things that compete for God's place in our lives. Sometimes it's, it's bad things, but more often than not, it's things that are, are good, the blessings, God's gifts to us that have taken the place of God. And so the gifts now become God to us. The Bible uses the word idolatry for that. And he's saying, I think what Jesus is pointing us to is to assess what the priorities of our hearts are. Because whatever we run to and whatever we adore, we worship. And so he's inviting us into and telling us that when we hallow God's name, we're reordering the priorities of our hearts. We all do this. John Calvin said that our hearts are idol factories. and We're constantly putting things in God's place. We're constantly hallowing other things. Hallowed be my job. Hallowed be my wealth. Hallowed be my health. Hallowed be my power. Hallowed be even good things that have become too important. And Jesus is saying, no. When we hallow his name, he becomes first in our lives again and everything else finds its correct order on the basis of that. That when we worship him and adore him and revere him and praise him and enjoy him, things click into place in our lives because what we need more than our next breath is for God to be first in our hearts. He is glorified when we do that and we are incredibly joyful because our lives will only make sense when we're living with God first. I think Augustine said that our hearts are restless until they rest in God, until God meets us and rewires us to put him first so that we enjoy him and everything else finds us color and meaning from that when we hallow his name. The third foundation Jesus gives us here is that we should affirm and remember our preference for God's reign. So verse 10, he says, pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now in many ways, this is an outworking of the previous point, right? We've just said, God, we want you to be first in our lives. We hallow you, we love you. You're the king of our lives. What does that look like practically? It looks like God coming to reign in us, through us, and around us. 
and us praying for more of that. It looks like us saying, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is what it looks like for us. We, we start to allow and ask God into our lives a bit more, to own us and use us, to work through us. It looks like us asking God to work in the lives of others around us and to God, just simply for God to have his way. When we worship God, we recognize his goodness in our lives. And so it becomes easier for us to pray that prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Not my will, not my preferences, not my desires, not my ambitions, not my wisdom. God, you know what I need. You know what's best and you don't make mistakes. You're the perfect sovereign father who has told us that you know what we need. So yes, God, your will be done. Your will be done. This isn't natural to us. Our hearts are sinful and prideful, so we think we know what needs to happen and what we need. And Jesus is is calling us here to a, a, a joyful submission that we would again remember that what God wants to do is the most important thing. And that would be much better to agree with God about that fact, that we would ask him for his will to be done rather than having our own plans and asking him to bless them and make them happen. Now we can petition God. He gets to that a bit later, that we can ask for God to work. And this is somehow even mixed up in this very point. I'll get to that just now. But the first place Jesus starts with is submitting to that, agreeing that, yes, God, the best thing for my life, the best thing for this world and for the people around me is for your kingdom to come and your will be, to be done. That we experience a taste of heaven now. We're not going to treat you like a magic genie who has to do what we say. We're going to agree that what you want to do is the best thing for us. C.S. Lewis says that there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, all right, have it your way. It might seem like a blessing, but it isn't, because he knows what we need. And so we can surrender and rest. God wants to help us rest in his will because he's a good father who knows what we need. But this is also somehow tied up in mission. This is about submission, but it's also about mission because when we're praying for God's will to be done, we're partnering with his work and his kingdom coming to bear in the lives of others and in our own lives as well. We're asking him to work. God has made so much clear in his word of what he wants to do. There's a lot of mystery, but there's a lot of things that are clear too. And so we can pray things that he's told us to pray. We can pray, God, please bless that person. God, pour out your spirit in that situation. God, give wisdom there. Bring healing to that. God, forgive there. God, please give sustaining grace there. God, help us enjoy you more. There's so much clarity around what he wants to do from his word. And God wants us to partner with him in praying those things for his will to come. Sometimes we get into a a pattern of thinking that prayer is about twisting God's arm. And if we can just ask things in the right way, we can crack the code and force him to do something, convince him to do something. No. Martin Luther says prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of his willingness It's not overcoming his reluctance. It's laying hold of his willingness. God's made it clear. He's he's made so much clear of what he wants to do. And he says we can pray those things with confidence because he wants to answer them. He's he's said that in his word. And so when we pray these prayers that Jesus tells us to, to pray, we're partnering with God in bringing and putting his kingdom and will to work. And this is good for us. We have a preference for the reign of God and the will of God above our own will and above our own kingship. The fourth foundation when we pray, Jesus tells us to press into is to ask and trust for our provision from his hand. Verse 11, he says that we should pray for God to give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. 
Because this reminds us that everything we have comes from him. It reminds us that everything in our lives, everything we have and need, comes from the sovereign kind hand of our Father. Even our daily bread. This talking about physical provision. It's also extending beyond that to every need we have because we in are in total need of God to provide for us. But Jesus tells us to pray for this, to pray for it. How often have we been needy and reverted and, and just sulked or gotten angry? No, we must pray. We're too quick to grumble and too slow to petition our Father in prayer. And Jesus is saying we need to flip that order. That's why he includes it in the prayer. We need to flip that order. That we need to be quicker to petition him and ask him to provide and slower to grumble in our hearts. And Jesus didn't pros uh, promise prosperity, but he did say he knows our every need. And it's true that sometimes we forfeit his provision because we won't ask and we neglect prayer. There, there is something to this. James 4.2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. Luke 11 tells us that God is a good father who gives good gifts to his kids. And he says he knows what you need. Now, he, he doesn't always answer how we think he should. He doesn't always say yes. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says later. But he does say that he knows what we need and that he's promised that if he even provides for the sparrows, he'll provide for us. Something amazing happened in my life about seven or eight years ago. Um, no, it was less than that, maybe five years ago. Um, we, we, we had, uh, well, yes, I'm talking about something about my marriage, and we've only been married for just under six years. So, yes, five years ago. We had just gotten married, and we were very young, and we, we, we decided, um, yo, we, we had nothing. And um, we, we just decided we were going to go for it, and we trusted God to provide. And early on in our marriage, we had... Um, just a, a big medical expense that, that um, scared us and, and we, had, we just didn't know how we were going to make it through the month. This happened early in the month. And there was a lot of the month left and we were praying, God, what are we going to do here? Please, Lord, we decided to pray about it because there's, there's nothing else. We just prayed, God, please, would you provide for us this month? Please help us put food on the table. Please take care of us. About a week after that, um, I got invited here to speak at, at a, a, um, one of the meetings on Tuesday, a Tuesday Fellowship, and uh, I, I gave a talk that was on my heart, and um, the only, I didn't mention anything about our need, but I just mentioned that uh, I was at the time studying at the Baptist Theological College, and one of the ladies came up to me afterwards and said, um, you know, Dave, um, from time to time, we just like to give gifts to, to people who are studying at BTC, so could you please send me your bank details? And I, yes, uh, please. Uh, so I, I hurried to, to give those. Um, but there's some moments in your life that, that God burns into your hearts and, and uses to shape you. Because about a day or two after that, a amount of money appeared into my account. And like I said, I didn't mention a thing, but it was almost to the rand exactly what we had spent on the medical expenses. Now God knows what you need. And sometimes he uses moments like this to put faith into your heart for his provision. As I said, he doesn't, pro he doesn't promise prosperity, but he does promise provision and to care for his kids. And Jesus tells us to petition him for this with faith. Relentlessly, as a child petitions their father for something. Give me, give me, give me. He invites us into that. Knowing he doesn't always say yes, but he does always know what we need and he does care for us as his kids. The fifth foundation when we pray is that Jesus says we can remember our pardon through God's gospel. Look at verse 12. Jesus says that we must pray for God to forgive us our debts. Also, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Jesus is telling us to remember our forgiveness. That through the gospel, 
He has paid the debt for our sin and he has taken us from being guilt-filled sinners to, and made us and transformed us into grace-filled sons and daughters. There is, something has happened to us that Jesus has taken away the penalty for our sin by taking it on himself so that we can become his children. He has saved sinners like you and like me. And we enter in through faith into an eternal relationship with him. And Jesus is saying when we pray that, forgive us our debts. We're remembering verses like Romans 5, 8 that says, God proves his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're coming back to the cross and to what Jesus did to forgive us our debts. And he's also telling us about the importance of this role of daily repentance. Now it's true that we pray that sinner's prayer once and God hears us and he saves in his sovereign mercy. But daily repentance is important to our walk with him. And he's saying that daily repentance helps us remember the gospel daily. It frees us from the burden of sin. It leads us to joy in Christ. It leads us to experience afresh the forgiveness of our Father. It helps us relive the gospel story. This is amazing news. The story of life used to be that you get what you deserve. In the gospel, the message of the gospel is you get what you don't deserve. That God has given us his grace, his mercy, forgiveness, freedom, new life, his spirit, a relationship with him. We get what we don't deserve. And so when we pray, God, forgive us our debts, we're, we're getting the gospel to wash over our hearts again and recalibrate our hearts around the good news of what Christ has done for us by dying on the cross in our place for our sins. What Jesus says next is extremely interesting and challenging. He says that this forgiveness that has happened in us also needs to play out in our relationships with others. He says, if we've been forgiven, we should also forgive those who've sinned against us. We've been given what we didn't deserve, so now we can give those who've sinned against us what they don't deserve, as we have also forgiven our debtors. He makes this point very strongly in verse 15, uh, 14 and 15, and what he's saying is that forgiven people forgive, that the gospel gets into us and then it flows in us so that it'll flow out of us as a natural response. We tend to withhold forgiveness. But where would we be if Jesus had withheld his forgiveness for us? He pours it out generously and he tells us that every morning there is new mercy in him. And that when this gets into us, it needs to flow out of us as agents of forgiveness pointing to the ultimate forgiveness in the gospel. The sixth thing Jesus says that we need to pray into is simply our protection by God's power. Verse 13, he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus is saying that even though we are new creations and we have new life in them, sin still lives in us and we still live in a sinful world. And lest we forget, Satan is still at work against the people of God, pulling them away from the king. And so we need to pray for God's deliverance because he is powerful to help us resist and to defeat and to overcome and to grow in holiness. I don't think we talk about this much in church anymore these days, but we really should, because becoming Christ-like is central to what this whole thing's about, and it's central to our joy as well. We've been set free from sin, and now we get to live free from sin. We're not slaves to sin anymore, and so we shouldn't live as slaves anymore. Christ tells us not to conform, but be transformed into his likeness for his glory and our joy. But we struggle with this, don't we? Paul says in 
uh, Romans 7 that he does the things he shouldn't do and he doesn't do the things he should do. There's just this war going on within, within us. We're new creations, but sin, sin is still somewhere in there deep down. Jesus is telling us to pray so that we can fight sin and pursue him. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, I think God wants to encourage us. This is what it says. It says, be alert, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. And I think Jesus is telling us to pray because of this. If we're going to stand strong and fight sin, it's not going to be because of our willpower. It's not going to be because we're so strong and we fight so hard. We're not strong enough and we can't last that long. We need to pray because when we ask God for his help and his deliverance, he puts his spirit in us. He puts his power in us and enables us to stand strong and stand firm and to resist. He puts his love in us and helps us love him more than sin and pursue him more. He, he rewires what we love and what we pursue. He rewires what we love and what we pursue when he puts his spirit in us and he helps us stand strong. So Jesus says, pray for deliverance. Too often we forfeit God's help because we don't pray. And so we lose, more, we lose the battle more than we win the battle. And you do that long enough, we'll become spiritually complacent. And when that reigns, the result is inevitable. All because we neglect prayer. But Jesus says when you cry out to him and call out for him, he loves to answer that prayer and he meets us in our time of need. About seven or eight years ago, I had a, we had a friendship group who, who part of Rosebank Union. I, I grew up in this church, if you didn't know that. And um, we were part of the young adults. And um, he, he was very honest with us. And we loved him for it. But he told us, guys, I'm struggling with my faith. And I'm not sure I believe this anymore. And this broke our hearts. It, it, it really broke our hearts. But we decided, okay, you know what we're going to do? I mean, of course, we're going to meet up with you for coffees and, and talk about this. And, but what we're going to do more than anything else, we're going to pray for you. And so a group of eight of us put together a roster. And we had two guys on the Monday, two guys on Tuesday, two guys on Wednesday, two guys on Thursday. And on Friday, we would all fast and pray together for our friend. And we decided we're going to, we're going to do this for two months. We would cry out day by day. These were powerful moments as we prayed for our brother. We didn't get past four weeks before God met him and broke into his life and turned his heart back to Jesus. This is what God does when we cry out for him to protect us from falling away. He loves to get into us and keep us and hold us tight. We just need to pray that dependent prayer, God, I need you. I need you, Father. Please help me. We've been talking about prayer these last two weeks, and, and I trust it's been encouraging and helpful and stirring. But I want to end with the most important aspect of, of prayer. The most important aspect of prayer. Because what's going to keep you in him? What's going to help you stand firm? What's going to keep you from falling away? What's going to drive you towards him? and grow in him, and pursuing him. This is maybe the most encouraging thing in the Bible, it, is that the Bible tells us that God prays for us. It says that the Spirit intercedes for us, that Jesus intercedes for us as our high priest, and he's constantly doing that, it never ends. I want us to just look at one of the passages, just two verses, where Jesus shows that he's praying for his people. The context of this, it's, it's Luke 22, verse 31 and 32. And Jesus is speaking to Simon Peter, who's just about to deny him. And before he, he does deny him, Jesus says this to Simon. He says, Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, that you would turn back, and when you do that, you would strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew he was going to deny him and mess it up, yet he resolves to pray to bring him home. 
That is the God that we worship. And he does the same thing for his people. Robert Murray Machane says this, If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Jesus is praying us all the way home. Let's respond to this God who loves us. Let's respond to this father who's died to make us his kids. Let's respond to this God of the gospel. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for the privilege of prayer. Thank you that you are our father and we get to come to you as your kids. Thank you that we can embrace you through prayer. God, thank you for how you're drawing us in to sync with you through prayer and that you love to do that, God. Thank you that um, you know what we need and, and you love to care for your people. And so we just cry out to you again this morning as we looked at this Lord's Prayer that you would, please, as we pray dependently, that you would help us hallow your name more, that you would help us pursue you more, that you would help us pursue your will more, that you would provide for us, Jesus, please that you would help us understand our forgiveness in Christ more and that you'd empower us to forgive others more as ambassadors of the ultimate forgiveness of Christ and that you would help us grow as your kids in becoming like your son Jesus. Empower us, Lord, to fight sin. Empower us to pursue you. Encourage us that you're praying us all the way home. Uh, Thank you, God, that you're available to us. We need you more than our next breath. We pray that you would come and meet with us now, rewire and reorder the affections of our heart to love you more and to pursue you more. Thank you for this glorious gospel. Amen.